my friend, we are live on Facebook. So with that, I'm going to, I'll keep letting people in. Um, I'm not even going to tell you guys my name because it's not my night. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Brother Ryan Flynn, and away we go. Fantastic. Thank you, by the way, brother, for helping me set this up. I uh, couldn't have done this without you. I, I was kind of lost for a little bit and definitely needed a, <laughs> a reliever here. So uh, I appreciate it. It's always good to see you again as well. Um, everyone, I'm kind of overwhelmed with how many people have showed up to this. Uh, by my count right now, we have 229 people in the room, which is uh, a little overwhelming for me. So I will probably mess this up, and I apologize uh, uh, for them. Um, so before I get into uh, the presentation, I have to make a couple of announcements. Uh, these are kind of standard ones. Uh, my name is Ryan Flynn. I am a member of Phoenix Lodge of 105 in Tilton, New Hampshire. I'm also a District Deputy Grand Education Officer for the Grand Lodge of New Hampshire. Um, that being said, I need to make it abundantly clear that what I'm about to say is in no way a representation of the Grand Lodge or the Lodge that I represent. These are all my thoughts uh, based on my Masonic travels as I go around the country uh, over the past uh, eight years. And, uh, you know, based on what I've seen, what I've learned, and and what I've tried to do in my own lodge. Um, the other thing I need to say is this is Zoom. It is not in a lodge meeting. Um, there are non-Masons in here, which are fine because what I'm going to be talking about is something that uh, needs, which I feel should be applied to certain lodges in America, but it also can be applied to different organizations other than Masonry. Um, so uh, with that in mind, Keep your comments uh, on the level and uh, make sure that we don't talk about anything that you would not be talking about on the street. Um, that being said, uh, again, we're up to 238 people now, so that's insane. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, which is right here. And someone give me a thumbs up if that's good to go. Great, thank you. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name, as I said, my name is Ryan Flynn. Uh, I am a artist. I, I went to school for art. Uh, I'm a painter. Uh, I've dabbled in quite a different, uh, quite many different mediums and stuff like that. But I consider myself a Masonic artist. And the way I view that title is that with my art, I try to represent the ideals of the craft in my artwork. And I try to do that without doing it on a superficial level. I'm not someone who's going to paint a giant square and compass uh, on a canvas and, and be happy with it. I like to get into the meat and potatoes of Masonic philosophy and try to represent that in my artwork. Um, over the past uh, several years, I've been traveling around the country talking about how to incorporate the arts into people's lodges. And as I've been going around the country, I've been able to meet a lot of brothers who feel kind of the same way, that there's something that we want to bring back into the fraternity that was there at some point and no longer exists or, or exists in a diminished state. As I traveled around and kind of did my rounds, and many lodges that I visit, I, I come back to around the country, I've noticed something. I've noticed that and I'm not by no way am I saying it's because of me. I'm just noticing this movement that's happening in Freemasonry that is representative of a Masonic Renaissance. And that Masonic Renaissance, I believe, is at hand. What I'd like to do is discuss what the Masonic Renaissance is, in my viewpoint, and how we can join it if we so choose to do. So to get things started, there is one thing that I, or a few things that I need to get off of our, um, out in the open right now. And that is what this presentation uh, is. Office. If you guys could just mute your, your, uh, thank you. Appreciate it. So what is this presentation not about? Okay. I am not going to sit here and tell you how to get a lot of new members. In fact, as I was saying before this, uh, we went live, um, with, with uh, the recent events of the world happening, and I'm not talking about either side, I'm talking about how Masons have been representing themselves on social media and other things. I think that we need to be focusing on ourselves a little bit more than getting new members at the time. So I will not be working on getting you new members. It's not my problem. And lodges have different uh, uh, methods of how they do Freemasonry, and that's fine. 
there's no way that I can tell another lodge that I'm not a member of what they need to do to bring in members. It just doesn't work that way. The second thing that I'm not going to tell you about is a quick way to fix your lodge. I don't actually like the term fix your lodge. One of the beautiful things about masonry is that each lodge has its own personality. So one lodge might be completely different in the way they approach masonry, but at the same time, we hold the sacred truths of our, of our ritual and our methods and our recognition so that we have this commonality, which is the masonry. A person coming in from a different lodge saying, you're doing this wrong, is not going to help the situation at all. It actually, I think, builds, uh, builds more walls than it builds uh, bridges. So I'm not going to be doing that. It's not my business to fix your lodge. The last thing I want to say is I'm not going to tell you an easy way to make your lodge better. What I'm about to propose to you is not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. And it's something that is not going to be done if you don't decide to do it with your full intentions. So that's what this presentation is not about. What is it about is the Renaissance, the Renaissance of Freemasonry. So in order to understand what the Renaissance of Freemasonry is, I want to take time to go back and explain to you what the Renaissance was. So to begin with, the Renaissance is a very complicated uh, period of time that has very complicated reasons for coming into being. This isn't something where two people decided, hey, we're going to have a renaissance. The renaissance was a reactionary movement that turned into something else and eventually evolved into what we now think of when we think of the renaissance. So where does it all begin? It actually begins with something that's a, a little common, uh, common knowledge to us all today, and that is plague. <laughs> um, in the mid-14th century, we had the Black Death in Europe. And before I get into this a little bit more, I need you to all understand that I'm taking select parts of the causality of the Renaissance. There is much more to this than what I'm going to talk about. I could spend many different lectures about what did this, and it would just take up forever. We wouldn't get to the point. So if you forgive me, I'm going to simplify this quite a bit so that we can just get a, a gist of why this happened. So in the mid-14th centuries, we had the Black Death. As you know, a large, uh, large percentage of our population got wiped out by the bubonic plague. And this bubonic plague came from the east and, and kind of spread out through certain ports around Europe, uh, mainly in Sicily and Italy, um, and then around Istanbul or Constantinople at the time, um, and kind of waved through Europe. And this is, um, you know, from our point of view, the Black Death seems like this horrible thing where, you know, if we think of if we only understood how uh, sanitation worked, if we only understood how germs moved about, then this could have been avoided. That's a very modern way of looking at what the Black Death was. But in order to understand why this turned into a renaissance eventually, we have to erase what we think of logically in our mind and try to think of this, that event through the eyes of the people who live there. Science gets pushed out the door for a moment. And you start to think that everything and every, uh, every event, whether it be good or bad, is based on the judgment of God. So if something good happens in your life, God is pleased with you. If something very bad happens in your life, God is very mad at you. If something very bad happens to a society, it's God's fault that this happened. It is your fault that God allowed this to happen. That's a better way to put it. So when we see horrible things happening in this part of, uh, part of history, we have to take that into consideration. Consider, for example, your, uh, your wife dies in labor in uh, the year 1300. We can't say that she had you know, sepsis or that she got a blood uh, infection and that's what caused it. God wanted her to die because she did something that displeased him. So that's an interesting way of looking at this. So if we take that mindset and we look at what the Black Death was and the scale of the Black Death, you can see how absolutely demoralizing it was on a human level. Around the same time, when all this death and destruction is just a constant, we start seeing writings where people are looking at life or the human condition in a different way. The two main ones that um, kind of... Um, Hotwire, the Renaissance, or Petrarch and Dante. Now, these aren't the only two. Like I say, I'm kind of limiting this just in the interest of time. But Petrarch starts writing about the human condition and how we can better ourselves. 
Let us quote to you as five enemies of the inhabitants. If ever ambition, envy, anger, and pride, if these were to be banished, we should be infallibly enjoy perpetual peace. Then we have Dante, who takes uh, a much more religious and harsh tone at life. Now, we all know of the Divine Comedy, which is famous for, and because of its symbolism and uh, originality, we tend to focus especially on his path through hell in the Inferno. But he also writes beautifully elegant things about paradise and how uh, what man can accomplish with God on his side. One of his great quotes is, Oh, grace abounding and allowing me to dare to fix my gaze on eternal light so deep my vision was consumed in. He's talking about this source of light that's in the world in a time where only darkness is visible to everybody. So something happens with this. Right around the time when the Black Death ends, again, mid-1400s, and I'm, I'm kind of roughing this out, we see something. We see this human condition start to be the focus of writers and, and uh, philosophers and even artists at the time. People start seeing that now that all this constant suffering at that scale is no longer around, we want to focus on what makes us human, what makes life worth living, because we actually have a chance now to live. And again, I can't stress this enough. This is a very simplified answer to this. Life was not easy, life was not great, especially if you were rich. It was a horrible time to live for everybody in comparison to today's world. But in their eyes, when the Black Death goes away, it is because God has allowed it to go away. His punishment is over. And now we must see ourselves again with God's people. So what happens? These writings start happening, and because of the writings, art changes as well. We start to see slight changes. Before this era, which I'm showing you now, which we like to call the Proto-Renaissance, which is before what we commonly refer to as the Renaissance, we see some things happening in art. For example, if you look on the right, this is a Madonna and Thrones, you can start to see that people are starting to have shape and mass to them. Even. They're observing the human in front of them, and then trying to portray them to the arts. This is very different from the extremely stylized and rigid look of art beforehand. One of the common misinterpretations of art before this in the Middle Ages is that, uh, for example, uh, the infant Jesus always looked like a grown man because they didn't know how to draw a grown man. Well, that's not true. That wasn't important. Uh, depicting someone as they were was not important as the message in which the piece was. So you put all the focus on that piece so that they understood what they were looking at. Remember, these people are illiterate. The pro renaissance changes that, and we start looking at the focus of actual humans, the human condition, the human Mary. So we see that in this piece. And if we look to the right, we have the artist who kind of jump-started the Renaissance, who his name was Giotto. And then this fresco, you can actually see something completely changing from the left where we have a natural scene. We have a blue sky. We have different viewings of, uh, or viewpoints of the subjects in this uh, scene. We see the backside of people kneeling at the foot of Christ. We see someone looking the other way. We see different skin tones, changes. Art is now representing the actual human condition as much as the message that's in it. And this is what jump starts the, re uh, the Renaissance, artistically. The height of the Renaissance, or what we call the proper Renaissance, as opposed to the proto-Renaissance, can be dated to a couple of things. One of them was a competition between these two gentlemen, Filippo Brunelleschi on the left and Lorenzo Ghiberti on the right, who, in the beginning of the 1400s, had a, were involved in a competition to do the baptistry doors of the Duomo of Florence, the Cathedral of Florence. Ghiberti won on the right. Filippo lost on the left, and they changed what they were going to do in life because of this. Brunelleschi on the left rediscovers classical architecture, and he starts learning about physics in a rudimentary way. He learns about geometry. He learns about observing how the ancients did these things. The ancients referring to the Romans, who then were copying the Greeks, or so were now referencing the Greeks for the first time in art. Ghiberti on the side, uh, on the right, almost reinvents or rediscovers the classical style of art of uh, sculpture. 
where we now see these amazing bronze doors that he took the rest of his life to do with realistic depictions of figures showing weight, uh, attitude, emotion, figures that are based on natural ways of representing people. Again, they're mirroring it after the way things were done before. So what we're doing now is seeing this commonality of the ideas of the past being the popular vision of the present. And that's what the Renaissance was. Now, the quick way that people like to describe how the Renaissance moved through Europe is that it started in Florence and kind of spread around there. That's a very easy way of looking at this, but it's actually not true. This thought process was universal in Europe at the time. So if we were to look over, for example, at the same time when the Duomo was being capped, we can see Van Eck in, uh, in the north doing his famous Ghent Altarpiece, which is a masterpiece of early Renaissance art. Look at the people compared to that gold painting that we saw before. There's human form, emotion. You can probably identify with very little knowledge of this piece who you're looking at in this. You can pick out St. John the Baptist. You can pick out Adam and Eve. You can pick out um, different people coming to adore the Lamb of God, which sits in the middle down here. This is what's happening throughout Europe. In fact, Renaissance does move through Europe in, in an interesting way, where these ideas of the past emanate from the Italian peninsula and move and morph into different forms throughout Europe. So, for example, when the Renaissance kind of hits England in its own way, it's more of a literary and uh, drama-based Renaissance. When you go into the, um, to the west or the north, we see music taking up form. Uh, we see different styles of painting happening in France and Spain. All this happens because of the newly discovered ancient texts. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we were to simplify the Renaissance even more, what we could say is that the Renaissance is three different things. We have philosophy, we have ancient wisdom, and we have Catholicism, Christianity, if you wish. We have Greek philosophy. As I said, we look back, the, the, the men of the Renaissance and women uh, of the Renaissance look back at Greek philosophy as the source of the great knowledge of the human existence. So we see uh, newly discovered uh, uh, translations of Plato, different sources of humanism, and understanding the human condition now being translated into Latin, and therefore, into uh, we had languages like Tuscan and other early uh, versions of, of Italian. So people were starting to get this. And when I say people, let's be frank, these are very rich people who are trying to get this in, mainly because of their love of knowledge and also because it is a symbol of status. If you have a lot of books, if you're in the library, you were very important and you were very knowledgeable. Therefore, I must trust you and get, let you make all the important decisions. So we bring these in. And people like uh, the Medicis are having everything that they could possibly do be translated so that this ancient knowledge is available to them. Then we bring in esoteric knowledge as well. We have concepts like Christian Hebrew mysticism, which starts coming in through earlier writings, which are now being uh, brought into private libraries. The ideas like alchemy, both physical and spiritual and things like Hermeticism are all being brought together and translated and packaged into these areas of study that people are now flocking to, if permitted. All of this, at the time, is used to support Catholicism, or a version of Catholicism. Some dare to stray completely away. Others, like Pico Maradola, will use this to try to figure out this commonality that fits in with their spiritual life so that they can discover a truer version of the spiritual awakening that's happening. This kind of sounds familiar, and we're going to get into that for a second, but it's important to realize that everything you're looking at right here is a representation or a modern representation at the time of something that was already built. Things that we see and take for granted as being original are actually just a modern twist on something that was already done. They just simply observed, packaged it together, added a little Christianity, and sent it out into the world again. In fact, if you look at the famous creation of Adam at the top, um, 
the figure of God is actually an almost picture perfect rendition of a torso called the Belvedere torso, which was dug out of the earth in Rome. Michelangelo saw this sculpture and said, I will use this as a model for the Sistine Chapel, and he put it up there. This is what it is it's a representation of the past with a slightly new twist on it. And at that same time, that twist pushes mankind further along this path of enlightenment, so to speak. So again, we have Greek philosophy, esoteric knowledge, capitalism, and patronage all put together. This is what the Renaissance is. Now, if we were to make a slight change to this, something interesting happens. If we were to take Greek philosophy, liberal arts and sciences, for example, esoteric knowledge, you know, Christian and Jewish mysticism, and so on and so forth, and we replace the specific Catholic dogma and patronage and replace it with a universal spiritual and personal growth, we have the basis of Freemasonry in its earliest state. What Freemasonry hints at in its earlier writings, this renaissance of our own souls. And that, I think, is the tie to what the Masonic Renaissance is right now. It's not necessarily getting back to the way we do things. It's getting back to the source material of what Freemasonry was at the beginning. And then taking that package, repackaging it a little bit to the mo into the modern world, and releasing it again through the ways we interact as Freemasons together. So what are the signs that these are actually happening? Well, as I said, what I'm doing here is, after my travels in the last eight years, I've seen what lodges are doing and see how it kind of groups into this idea of taking the old and repackaging it and putting it into the new with a modern twist. And there's definite signs this is happening. Here are a few things that come to mind. Masonic philosophy is becoming the focus of many lodges. We are seeing a move from recitation to understanding, from quantity to quality. The lodges that are giving, I'm using it as an example for this presentation, none of them are doing active membership recruiting. None of them, not one. They're looking from within and trying to make sure the people in their lodges are fulfilled as men and as, as masons. We have new academics that are advancing our understanding of the craft. It's very easy for people to revere the writers of the past, to look at uh, Wilmshurst, to look at Pike and all those other guys who gave us this knowledge. But there are men in today's society who are doing it as just as well as those men as well, bringing new techniques and new understandings to ancient wisdom. We have men like Brother Oscar Allen, who's doing it. We have Sean Iyer, who's leading the charge and bringing this back. We uh, Chris Hall lodges have uh, uh, Ken Collins, who is just uh, amazing to listen to when he talks. This is happening everywhere, but in small patches. But it's happening. Those men deserve as much respect as we do to our ancient elders. Excuse me, to our elders. And we need to make sure that we listen to them because they are an absolute gift to the fraternity. And there are many more names than what I'm saying right now. Third, educational events are becoming popular. In lodges and in Grand Lodges. Most of the time when I speak around the country, it used to be because a lodge brought me there to have a talk. But now I'm seeing more and more lodges, uh, excuse me, Grand Lodges, embracing this idea that men crave what masonry was originally set up to do. And they are providing opportunities for people to get into it. I see evenings of Masonic Light. I see Grand Lodge education seminars. I see... Um, um, uh, research lodges putting on events, and even things such as big and as bold as Masonicon, where people are coming together to look at this old stuff again for, for the first time. And finally, it's not just in order to make this a renaissance, I would have to say that Masonic lodges need to incorporate the arts. If it doesn't incorporate the arts, I don't see it as a renaissance. I see it as an educational movement, which is just as important. But incorporating the arts into their lodges brings it to an entire level. And that's what I'm going to get into in a little bit. How are they doing this and how you can use the arts to bring all of these new ideas of education and understanding into your lodge. 
every lodge here that I've noted on this map is a lodge that specifically stood out to me when I visited it. It's a lodge that takes this into consideration and fulfills the needs and wants of its members and has also done something to provide something for the entirety of masonry through their actions. There are many more lodges other than these dots. These just happen to be the ones that I visited that stood out for me. I visited many more lodges than this, and if your lodge is not on this map, don't take this personally. I just referenced each one of these lodges in this presentation as I move forward. But this illustrates a point. This is not something that's happening in one corner of the country. It's not happening because three groups of, uh, a group of guys are getting together in a study hall and getting things done. This is blossoming just the same way that the map of Europe was, where we see different manners of Masonic education and the Masonic Renaissance popping up in their own stylized ways, but with that commonality of the promotion of the ancient ways of three masons. So let's get into it. What are these lodges doing? Let's learn from what they're doing. A lot of what I'm about to talk to you is based on interviews and talking to people while I was visiting there. Many times it's like, hey man, that was awesome. How, how did you get to that? And they would tell me. Um, and um, I'm putting my little twist on it as well, but I have to reiterate that what I'm about to talk to you here is tested and proven in these specific lodges. Doesn't mean it's not gonna work for you guys. But it's something to witness and understand and hopefully respect. So first, heavily guarding the West Gate. That's Masonic term for letting people in who should be there. Two, providing a meaningful lodge experience. The lodges that I visit, you want to be there at lodge. You don't want to miss lodge because you know you're going to miss them. Thirdly, education is happening during and outside of lodge meetings. And fourth, there is an incorporation of the arts. So let's get into these. The first one, the famous uh, phrase that's being tossed around like a rag doll in Freemasonry now is heavily guarding the West Sea. What does that mean? Well, this is the best explanation that was given to me, and it's the way I do it as well. And I'm saying this from a flawed point of view. I'm happy to, well, I'm not happy to admit, but I will admit that I have signed petitions for men who should not have been in the fraternity. And I know some of you in this room are thinking the exact same way. I went through that mindset of let's get as many members into this lodge as possible because we'll have more manpower and with more manpower, we're going to achieve more. A flawed point of view. One brother told me when I asked him, when I asked him about this thing, told me this and it stuck with me. Think of it as letting someone into your family, not your lodge. His exact words were, I will not sign a petition or vote someone into my lodge unless I trust them with my kids. That is something to be held. How many times have we voted on someone just strictly because of, you know, a report that came back? Or that, yeah, I know him, he's a good guy, just trust him, just vote him, okay, he's in great, give him a dues card and now uh, make, him, make him an officer. That doesn't work. These lodges, the entire lodge knows him and his family before he receives a petition. In fact, in the, the most healthiest lodges that I've been to, lodges that one time where they meet for masonry, in fact, they meet so many times outside of the Masonic Lodge that it makes the Masonic experience even more special because it's a time to put away that common friendship and brotherhood, and meet on an entirely different level. A level that brings us all together spiritually and philosophically. The candidate also has a full understanding of what is expected of him. And the lodge member set an example. How many times do we demand excellence and then promote, uh, promote half-assing it? It's a hard question to ask ourselves. I'm fully admitting that I did not do a good enough job, and I still don't do a good enough job in promoting excellence in my lodge. We need to be able to look at ourselves as much as the candidate so that we can prepare a room and a new home for this brother. Guarding the West Gate also means guarding us as well. Remember that. Guarding against brothers too. The idea of Freemasonry is being the sanctuary where men can get together on such a deep level 
being able to tell each other when you need to check yourself, brother, or you're kind of being an ass here, brother. You know, let's let's work on this. If you're in a true Masonic Lodge, you understand that the brothers are not doing this because of some personal jive against you. They're doing it out of love, and you should respect what they're saying to you. You might not disagree. You might not agree with them, but that's okay. If they're coming from love, and if you trust that they're coming of love, growth will occur because of this, which is one of the preeminent um, themes of Freemasonry: growth. No one be, can become an amazing person by talking to themselves. It doesn't work that way. You need some sort of guidance. So, what are with these themes? What are the ideas that have worked? What have these lodges actually done? Here's some actual. Um, things that lodges have done around the country that have been a huge hit for those specific lodges. First one, mandatory vetting period for candidates before candidate is even given a petition of at least six months. That means that before you give him a petition that is unsigned, you've known this man for six months so that you completely understand him. You completely know him. You know his family. You know his wife's name. You know his wife's birthday. Just so you can be on that level with that brother. There is no surprises when the petition is read in lodge. Everyone in that room knows it. Candidates are required to do some sort of work. This is kind of a, not like a trial by fire, but it's kind of a showing that they want to be involved. And this can be a presentation that they do inside of the lodge that's obviously at rest. Um, you can have him uh, be involved in a discussion or be involved with some sort of event and stuff. This is not, to be clear, a hazing type thing. This is an opportunity for this brother or this potential brother to work with you, to break bread with you, to understand his new family before he comes in. If you treat this as a hazing where it's like, hey, rookie, go clean the toilets, you're going to lose them. And you know what? You deserve to lose them. But inviting this person to be a part of the non-lodge events of your lodge is a way to have this com commonality blossom with this new member. One lodge that I love has a specific ceremony that for delivering the petition, where members of the lodge will all go over to his house and present it to him, and they make a whole deal of it. I don't want to get into any details about this because it kind of borderlines on some stuff that we shouldn't be talking about here, but let me tell you, Absolutely beautiful thing that they came up with just to make sure that this brother has that sort of attention put on him before he even, before he even has a signature on that petition. And finally, one watch says a mandatory sharing of social media platforms before that that person can be invited into the lunch. They want to make sure that this person conducts himself with uh, decorum in all public fields. That's a big one today. I won't get into it anymore. The second thing that they do, they provide a meaningful experience. Another quote that someone told me, we strive to make our Masonic meeting something that cannot be experienced anywhere else. This is kind of a problem right now because Masons and non-Masons, the world right now, is so used to meeting together as we are right now, digitally. We can have discussions of Masonic education right now. We can talk about the new stuff. We can lock the rooms, meet in private uh, video conferencing rooms, and talk about some stuff. So long as we guard that that link, we can talk about anything, really. If you're very large for it, be fair. But what does being in lodge provide that we cannot do here? There's a question you need to ask yourself. What do you miss most about meeting in lodge? I'm sure it's not the minutes. Provide something that enhances that part that we're missing right now so that when you come to law, you experience something that you will not get at home, that you will not get online, and that you will not get anywhere else except in a Masonic temple. This requires some heavy thinking and some brainstorming with your brothers. It can be in a manner in which you do your ritual, it can be a manner in which you uh, preside over a meeting or how the meeting is set up. There are so many different ways that we can get into this. And I, as I said before, it's not for me to tell you what that is. Your lodge has its own personality. 
discover what's missing from this meeting that we're having right now and get into it and bring it out when we're allowed to get back into our lives. And this is a warning too. We're all about to come back, God willing, from this break, digital break from Freemasonry. If we do not provide something that can be done, can, if, excuse me, if we do not provide something that cannot be done offline, we're doomed. If Freemasonry can be replaced by a Zoom meeting, then Freemasonry deserves to go under. There, I said it. We have to provide something that you cannot get on a digital platform. And we can do it. We've done it for so long. I'm willing to bet we can do it again. We need to keep that in our mind. Get back to the basics. What Freemasonry originally was was something that you could not get anywhere else. So some examples of what that could be. I like to call it serves. Here's my marketing thing. What happens in a mis providing a meaningful experience? There's solemnity in that meeting. Many lodges that I've visited practice absolute silence while they're in there because you are in a temple. You have environment. Many lodges that I've been in use actual candles instead of, you know, light bulbs. They use things like incense. They use music. They use... All these sorts of things to make sure that the environment that they are in is something completely sacred. We have ritual. A ritual is something that sets us apart from all other forms of fraternities or sororities or any sort of service clubs. Our ritual is sacred to us. Treat it as such. With ritual comes a responsibility, I like to say. If you can't do ritual, that doesn't mean you're a bad mason. It means you're a bad ritualist. And you have to be able to look at yourself and say, maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing for Lodge, or maybe I need a lot of extra help and, and uh, effort to make myself better. Either way, focus on making sure ritual is coming out as best as possible. Value. I have two kids and a wife. One of the things that, I've, that being at home this year with COVID has taught me is how much I'm away from my family. Your lodge experience needs to be of such value that it's worth me not reading to my kid at night for one night. It's worth me not wrestling with my two daughters before they go to bed. It needs to be worth that momentary break from the, uh, the, the normalcies of life to come together and do that. If your lodge experience is not valuable, how can you expect people to keep coming back? Education. As Brother Chris uh, Murphy said, he doesn't like the term education, Masonic education, because it's not Masonic education, it's Masonry. It's funny that we have to add this value, this word, to what Masonry is, to explain what Masonry is supposed to do. Masonry is, in, is supposed to instruct you on how to be a better person. What is the point of leaving my family to go listen to endless meetings, endless side comments and conversations, and people talking during ritual? The value is gone. I don't want to be there anymore. Education needs to be a member, if you uh, needs to be involved if you wish to join this idea of the Masonic Renaissance. And finally, providing a, a meaningful experience includes using your senses. We have ears. We provide music. Some lodges provide incense, uh, the candlelight, uh, dimly lit spaces. All these different things that happen, where it be maybe the way you all dress the state of your lodge room. Everything you see, smell, hear, touch, and sometimes taste in your meals needs to be at a level that makes you need want to go there. And I already went through this. Let's go. All right. So the third thing, education during and outside of lodge meetings. Again, this is what I've seen is commonality for all these lodges, which I like to say are involved in the Masonic Renaissance. Educational programs at every state of communication. And they're not just, let's do our business, let's do anything, are there any letters that we need to be run? Okay, uh, we've got 20 minutes. Does anybody want to do a 10 minute presentation? Which is very common. The educational programs are the meetings. Everything else is secondary. 
many masters, including a master of my lodge before I was, would get up and say, we're doing education first. If you need to leave because you have to drive home or you have other things after the education, by all means, we won't look down upon you and we wish you a happy evening. The education was the reason for having our state of communications. Isn't it funny how we've gone from having the term stated communications into monthly business meetings? You know, when I think about all the minutes and all the business that we go through, where it's, um, you know, reading all of the bills and voting on each bill individually, and it turns this temple into an accounting department. And I like to say that, you know, you go to some of these big businesses in the world and you go into their accounting departments, they don't call them temples. Well, we shouldn't be calling our, we shouldn't be using our temple as an accounting department either. We need to keep a reminder that what we are meeting in is not just a room. It's not just a meeting room. It is a temple built for masonry. Keeping that in mind helps us grow and helps us get back into the way things used to be. So they also have various educational events every year. So you're going to see evenings in Masonic Light. You're going to see guest speakers. You're going to see festive boards, things that happen outside of lodges. If you want to ask about what these are, we can talk about it after. Um, but there's different ways to bring educational events other than just opening lodge and having someone do a presentation. Many of the best educational events that I've ever been to have not happened in open lodge. They've happened at some sort of secondary meeting. Thirdly, expanded mentorship for candidates, pushing them hard. Don't just learn your catechism. Understand your catechism. If your candidate understands his catechism before he gets to his next degree, he's going to understand some of that degree while it's happening. And because of that, he's going to get more out of it. It's going to become more personal because he's going to have those eureka moments while he's in the degree. And that's something we should all be aiming for with our ritual. And finally, multi-lodge relationships. This is a beautiful thing. There's many of the lodges that were on that map that I showed you earlier have relationships with other lodges where they'll travel to and fro and come to see each other when they're doing something. You know, if there's, there's lodges in, in my jurisdiction that have uh, sister lodges 14, 15 hour away in a uh, 14 or 15 hour drive away from them. But every year they make sure that they come together and are there at different installations, uh, different various events, and that sort of thing. The bond that connects these two lodges is amazing. And it adds to this educational aspect that's happening outside of the lodge. And finally, from transitioning that's just simply into this educational movement and turning it into the Masonic Renaissance. There has to be an incorporation of the arts. Now, this is a broad topic, and the reason I bring it up in this way is I want to talk to you about how this is happening and give you actual examples. Because incorporating the arts doesn't mean putting up a poster in your wall. It means that you use the full power of the arts to make your lodge a better experience, to make where you meet, how you meet, what you talk about, the arts, and amplify all of this. So I'm going to go through this in four steps. Music, fine arts, literature, and architecture, especially literature and drama. So let's go. We're going to talk for a little bit here. First, music. The easiest way to look at music and the way that always that people always seem to flock to it is, you know, playing songs uh, while you're doing your ritual, which is a phenomenal idea. Highly recommend it. A lot of people know that Mozart was a mason, and that he wrote certain music for masonry, and that he wrote the magic flute as an homage to masonry. That's the easy way of looking at this. Not knocking it down. It's a great conversation to have. But let's use music in a different way to broaden our approach to Freemasonry. Every album that I'm showing you right here has something to do with a Masonic lesson that we preach. Something that is ingrained into our ritual is ingrained into these albums that you're looking at right here. Might not be easy to see right away, but they do exist. One of my favorite things I heard from an lodge out in the Midwest was that every year they take time, they dim down all the lights to watch, and they listen to the dark side of the moon. 
And they have a tough discussion about it because Dark Side of the Moon, if you get into the lyrics of what it is, is talking about the demise of men. You know, he talks, they talk about how time is a fleeting existence, that money really doesn't matter. And that, you know, there's this great big in the sky that we're all going to. And at the end, when you have full clarity and full awareness, you realize that there's absolutely no dark side of the moon. As a matter of fact, it's all dark. That's just one thing that that lodge does. And tell me you don't want to go to that. But I'll lead you in another example here. One that's kind of fitting. Excuse me. Oh, I skipped a slide here. I was on a roll. All right. So let's use one more example here, and I apologize. Simon and Garfunkel's The Sound of Silence. What is that song about? Think about it for a second. Everybody in this room, I'm just, I'm, I assume, has heard that song at one point. There's a new version by Disturbed right now, which is absolutely amazing. The Sound of Silence is an album, uh, is a song, excuse me, that talks about how different people are refusing to love each other, to listen to each other, and to see each other as equals rather than as rivals or enemies. They talk about listening to all these people who are talking but not speaking, playing music but not singing, empty promises done in the, in the uh, guise of lectures, meaningless conversations, and no self-awareness. It's a sad song talking about the state of the world in the state of the world in the 1960s. Doesn't that strike a lesson for all of this right now? Isn't that something that could lead into an amazing discussion that gets to the root of the problems of this world and not the, um, the superficial things that take up most of our time? It gets to the root of the problem. And that's a discussion worthy of a Masonic Lodge. You can have that discussion without getting into politics. It is about us, not them. I invite you to take that song, play it in the lodge, and have a long discussion about it with your brothers, keeping it civil, keeping it Masonic. And there you just had probably one of your best Masonic educational events, and all it took was three minutes of song. The fine arts. How do we incorporate the fine arts into Freemasonry? Well, it's easy to think of these gigantic scale projects that you see, and some of them are amazing. These are all fairly recent uh, works of Masonic art, which we've done around the country. And you can see what they've done to these buildings. The idea of commemorating a anniversary or a um, large event of your lodge with a work of art is something that is not new. In fact, this is something that goes back through human history. But we've turned into this kind of honor the man, not the message type of culture, where, for example, we have a brother who's been in the lodge for 30, 40 years. He's done a lot of good. And in order to uh, honor him when his time is coming to an end in the lodge or if he's moving away, we give him a certificate and say thank a lot. Now, this is coming from someone who designs certificates. But if you think about this, what we're doing is actually giving something that's going to be taken out of the lodge with the brother. When he passes away, it's most likely maybe if you're lucky being held on for a few years by the person who was closest to him, and eventually that never comes back to the lodge. The idea of commissioning, commissioning art or creating something that honors the message of that brother is something that's lost. An example would be if you had a brother who was very good at a certain part of virtual. Instead of giving him a certificate saying, thanks for doing that certain part of ritual, perhaps commissioning something to go with that part of ritual in his name so that it stays in the lodge. And that way, that work of art not only honors that brother, but it is also a gift to every mason in that lodge now and every mason that's going to come. What better way is there to honor someone than that? And these are small and large projects. You can do something that costs multiple thousands of dollars. You can do something that costs a couple hundred dollars. But the meaning of what you're going to bring into your lodge is going to be astronomical and well worth the price. So consider commissioning artworks for brothers. I mean, representing brothers, not for brothers. 
and see how your watch will grow slowly and slowly more beautiful. Now I have to give up a perfect example of what a small watch can do. And again, with my presentations, I really try not to talk about my own artwork. This isn't about me. In fact, I hope that when you incorporate the arts into your buildings and your lodges, you find someone else to do it. But here's one that I was involved in. I'm very proud to be involved in. This is Blackmore Lodge number 127 in Mount Gilead, North Carolina. Uh, this is what the lodge room used to look like. It is the classic Masonic uh, um, wall, you know, wood wall, faux wood walls, uh, old carpet, and all the necessary things that are required to have a lodge room. A few years ago, members of this lodge got together and decided that they wanted to do better. They wanted to do a hell of a lot better. So they passed the hat. They passed the hat. They passed the hat and decided that they were going to completely reinvent this space. So they came together as a lodge. These are members of the lodge doing this work. And they tore down those vaults. And they redid the walls. And they added this barrel vault in the middle, which was an amazingly brilliant idea. And that, that barrel vault was painted deep black. And in that wall, they streamed all of these LED light cords and laid them out in the night sky of the night the lodge was formed. So that when you take a degree, or when that that lodge room is lit in the way that they want, right above the altar of the lodge room is the night sky of the fountain of the lodge, and it looks phenomenal. I was brought in to fresco the lodge room. I mean, fresco is a loose term. I, I didn't fresco; I painted it, but in the style of the fresco. And I turned the walls into giant tracing boards and learning tools, and the lodge turned into this. I am extremely proud to be part of this project. I consider it one of my, my deepest works that I've done. And it's not, I'm not showing you this to say, hey, look what I can do. I'm showing you this to say, hey, look what a tiny lodge in the middle of nowhere can do. Look what art can do to your temple. Don't look at this picture right now as someone else's temple. Look at it, look at it like the possibilities of what you can do in yours. And when we nailed this, the reaction was huge. There was a line of people going outside the temple, down the hall, and out into the parking lot just to come in and see this new temple. People travel from around the, uh, around the state just to come and meet in this temple room now because of the efforts of this lodge. It reinvigorated masonry in the area. And all it took was a handful a large handful of masons saying, we can do better, let's do it. So that's the fine arts. There's much more that we can get into in there, but we can save that for further discussion. If you want to talk to me about this afterward, let's get into it. But literature and drama, let's bring these into Freemasonry. The first thing we think of when we talk about literature and drama is thinking about the great Masonic writers, Wells, Hurst, and so on and so forth. Um, but we can look outside of Freemasonry to talk about Freemasonry. I offer you this. To Kill a Mockingbird is one of the greatest works of literature in human history. Okay? And if Atticus Finch represents the ideal American man and what he stands for, equality, self-sacrifice, um, honor, if we can study him and look at him as an ideal person, maybe we can see a little bit of Masonry. This book talks about all of the great issues that are happening in the present world, even though it's so old. The ideas of racial injustice, the ideals of what we consider justice and what other people consider justice, the ideals of how horrible we can be as human beings, excuse me, the idea of how horrible we can be as human beings compared with how great we can be at the same time. This is a discussion that transcends religion, it transcends politics, and it's all packaged to us neatly in this book that requires us to dive in. And the beauty of To Kill a Mockingbird is that we don't need to read it. If your lodge is not a lodge of readers, you have the movie. And Gregory Peck is unbelievable in that movie. Everybody who is in this movie is incredible. So maybe on a lodge uh, night other than your lodge night, get together 
watch To Kill a Mockingbird or over several months, read it together and dissect it and learn about yourselves and learn about the human condition and figure out where masonry can kind of fit into this whole message. Architecture. Now I say architecture with the full understanding that no one in this room has a lodge that is willing to tear down their lodge and build the next Philadelphia Masonic Temple. I'm not going to suggest that. I'm not that crazy. But what I am going to suggest about architecture is this. Be proud of the space that you're in. Beautify it. Set aside room, set aside funds for lodge beautification might not be a lot, it might just be a little. But when you come into your Masonic Lodge, make sure that every aspect of that experience, including the room that you're in, is prepared for the solemnity of the work that is going to be done in this. There's a great quote by one of the popes, and I'm not gonna get into it, who started the idea of rebuilding St. Peter's Gisilka, something that we're gonna talk about in a second. And he said that no great uh, undertaking of spiritual or um, in, in his words, in Christian, uh, no great Christian undertaking at the time, can be done without the arts and architecture supporting it. They looked at the arts in the Renaissance as something that honored the message that they represented. And that were done in such a style that it completely reinvents the idea of an artist. You have to remember that before the Renaissance, there was no such thing as an artist. They were just simply craftsmen of their trade. He was a painter. He was a sculptor. But when the arts came in and the message that built up the Renaissance came into being, the Renaissance boom, the artist was born. Be an artist with your temple. See where you can improve it. Maybe sometimes improving it is just simply polishing the lamps, changing the light bulbs, fixing that tear in the seats. But take pride in the architecture of your lodge, whether it be a tiny room in the middle of nowhere or a great room in the middle of New York City. It doesn't matter. Honor them and add to them. And your architecture will grow with your lodge. There's one final lesson about architecture that I'll conclude this meeting with. And that is this. It's actually a lesson from history. I just mentioned St. Peter's Basilica. What we know as St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City right now is actually the second St. Peter's Basilica. The first one was built by Constantine many years before this one. But in the beginning of the Renaissance, it was decided that maybe we needed a bigger one. It was in disrepair, and we had a couple of ambitious popes that wanted to make sure that they had a big enough tomb. So they decided to knock down St. Peter's and rebuild a new one. This is actually the original plan for St. Peter's Basilica. Now, when this architecture was replaced, uh, when this architect, excuse me, was replaced several years down the road, it was replaced by this. This was the next one. And as you can see, they changed the ideas a little bit and kind of elongated the building a little bit. Then, and by the way, the architecture did this one was none other than Raphael. He decided that we're going to have three columns, uh, three colonnades going down the middle of it so that more people could fit into it. When Raphael died unexpectedly, another artist took over, and that artist was Michelangelo. Michelangelo seems to make the most uh, prolific uh, um, changes to the design. He actually knocks over parts of the old design that were being built because he realizes that they're unstable and they're not going, they're going to cause a lot of problems. So he reorganizes it a little bit. He shuts down some of the nave so that it could be better viewed from outside and more uh, beautiful inside. When Michelangelo died, it changed again and again and again until we get this, the final thing. There was multiple architects when we came into St. Peter's Basilica. And what we see now is a culmination of the Renaissance period. But if you take into consideration the history of St. Peter's Basilica, you're going to actually learn something. That while these architects all had the same goal of providing this great temple to all their masses, they fought on the way. They changed each other's plans, and they kind of worked in their own style and technique. There's actually quite a bit of mistakes in this design. Have you ever noticed when you look at a picture of St. Peter's Basilica that the facade of the building is too big? that the sculptures on the top are too big. 
you can't see the dome if you stand in front of it. That's a big problem with architecture. It's a failure in epic proportions of architecture. But what we still see with all these problems and these little quirks and stuff is a great temple built by a bunch of people. The reason I tell you this story is, is actually the last lesson that I see in these logics that are fulfilling this idea of the Masonic Renaissance. And that is the lineage of leadership. One of the most common, one of the great commonalities of these lodges is that many of them have dropped the idea of a progressive law. The reason for that is for a couple of reasons, actually. But one of them is this. When you have a lodge of 100 people and you need seven officers, you're talking about the upper 7% of a lodge. Those are the guys who have proven themselves worthy and that they're there all the time and they can do it. Many lodges around the country right now are barely filling seats, and barely filling officer seats. The preliminary requirements of being an officer is you've shown up or you're new enough to not know what you're getting into. Many of these lodges have transferred this idea of progression and replaced it with putting someone in each chair who is good at what that chair does. If someone's good at giving the middle chamber lecture, he becomes the senior. If someone's amazing at uh, uh, providing uh, uh, a warm greeting to uh, new members and making sure that people are done, they go in one chair. If someone's very good at leadership and very good at the business aspects of it, he might go in his master for a time or he might become secretary. But the idea of this hierarchy has been let go. I need to be unbelievably clear when I say this. I am not recommending you do this for your watch. I'm just pointing out that there's an option. No one can tell you if that's going to work or not for your lodge, but it is happening and there has been great effects to it. So consider that. Make sure that your leadership in each role, and remember that each member of your officer line is a leader in his own right. Make sure that there's a lineage there that sees common goal at the end, which is providing this temple to the masses. The Masonic Renaissance is happening. It's amazing to witness. There are things happening in this country in small groups, small groups that are setting out where lot experiences are becoming something that people travel for days to go see. I know members who travel to lodges where they factor in for each of their lodge, uh, uh, each of their lodge visits a hotel room so that they can be there or staying at a brother's house because they've incorporated this old idea of the spiritual and philosophical growth of, of the Freemason into their lodges and made it the purpose of their meetings. This is not a movement for everyone. This is not a movement that's easy. This is not a movement that requires little work or a little planning. But if you wish to join it, and you can, it's out there waiting for you. So thank you, brothers. Thank you, sir. I'm now going to let people unmute themselves. Um, so let the floodgates commence. And, uh, I'll go ahead. Um, I didn't see any questions on Facebook, so I'll stop streaming and just let the folks on Zoom uh, continue to party. Wow, there's a lot of comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Brother Paul, I saw your your, fa your hand up. I'll start there. I'm going to switch to looking at everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I'm Paul McCabe. I'm a 33rd degree Mason from Colorado live up in the mountains. I've been very active for many years in Blue Lodge, Consistory, York Rite, all of it. And your presentation tonight was excellent. I thank you for the invitation to come and join you. And I hope that uh, I'll receive an invitation to join in your, your future lectures. You did a fine job. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you, brother. And it's I've, I've visited a couple of lodges out in Colorado, and I know that your definition of mountains and my definition of mountains are very different. <laughs> I live at uh, 10,000 feet. <laughs> I know. <laughs> See any questions? <clears throat> 
could be either one. Uh, I'm filtering through the uh, the comments here, so forgive me. Brother Flynn. Brother, Brother Flynn. Oh, yes. um, I'm from uh, Southern Ontario, Canada, and uh, I belong to an observant lodge in Stratford, so mm -hmm. you would call me a convert to uh, the Renaissance, as you put it. I liked your, your talk. Um, so, so I have two questions. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the combination of a festive board, lodge meeting, and also do you have any comments about dress for lodge? Yeah, okay, so festive boards. So um, I'm actually a huge fan of festive boards. Um, and for those who don't know what a festive board is, it's kind of like a table lodge without ritual. Um, so uh, many times it's held in a restaurant or any place that has a, a meeting room or a meeting hall. Um, the tables are organized in kind of like a horseshoe type fashion where every brother is looking at each other. We don't want backs turned to everybody. And throughout the evening, we have toasts and songs and um, revelry. And um, usually there's some sort of Masonic discussion involved. Many times, uh, for example, the ones I travel to is when they'll have the presentation. Um, this is this is pretty fun, actually. I, I, I like it a lot because not only are you you're sharing bread, you're breaking bread with your brothers, but you, you have to drink with them. You're having a good time. I've never been in one actually that's been out of control. It, you know, you'd think that with toasts and stuff that it can get crazy. Uh, they've been all respectful, and um, it's it's a great way to have an event that doesn't bring people into your temple. And sometimes you kind of need a break from that. So if 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 you want to have an, a Masonic education event and you have a, a a restaurant down down the road, yeah. you go up to them and say like, "Hey, what can you feed us for for under uh, twenty bucks?" Then you factor in any travel things for your speaker if you're having one, and you have your event there. And uh, it, it's it's a great it's a great group of time. I, I actually prefer them sometimes to in lodge events because um, with the songs and the toasts and stuff, you you really become closer with your brothers. Um, uh, as for dress, so. I personally, and this is just me, I believe that uh, if you are a member of a Masonic temple, if you're a member of my lodge, for example, you wear a tux to lodge. We dress with the utmost respect for the meeting that's happening. That's me. If you're a member of a small lodge in the middle of nowhere and everybody's coming from work, um, you know, who am I to say that's wrong? In fact, uh, one of my, one of my uh, friends up here in New Hampshire, his name's Sam, he's an auto mechanic. And I have to say, there's something kind of special about being in a lodge room and then having a brother come in rushing from work with oil on his clothes and he puts on that apron and he sits down next to you because it reminds you how much Freemasonry transcends what you're putting on your person. And, and you know, I don't think there's a right answer. Each lodge has its own personality. I would just say that no matter what you wear, you treat your Masonic ritual and the experience that you're about to do with the utmost respect. For me, that's dressing to my absolute best. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so I'm, I'm Nathan Dresser from Caliburn in Cincinnati, Ohio. But I'm just kind of curious about this. Um, why was this whole movement, because I've noticed it you know, prior to this lecture, why is this happening now? Why was this not happening in the 70s or 80s? Or what what spurned this? And where do you think it's headed? So I I actually have an idea about this that is um so Freemasonry is an extremely personal and fluid philosophy. And Freemasonry has changed over the years. We we all have to admit that. Like different places and different times do Freemasonry different. And I think Freemasonry, because it's so universal in nature, morphs into the needs of society at its time. So, you know, when when World War One was was over, um, we had people coming back from the war and they needed to regain that brotherhood. When when World War Two happened, it happened again. And people were looking for brotherhood to be more than anything else. So we had this influx of uh, veterans and we had this massive push for membership because we were providing a form of brotherhood. And that's what they needed at the time. So there's nothing wrong with that. 
that this idea of they did it the wrong way or those guys screwed it up 20 years ago is preposterous. It really is. And it's insulting. You know, this is just the way Freemasonry kind of evolved over time. Now we're in a society that act is, is, is looking for something on a general level is looking for that spiritual essence of life, that philosophical uh, essence of life, but on the whole is not very interested in the dogmatic approaches of religion and Freemasonry, because we teach these great universal truths that all religions agree on is providing that. And the younger members are getting gung ho about this message and getting into it. It just so happens that if you look at the, um, the original texts of Freemasonry, you get to act into the, you know, bare bones about it. It happens to line up with what was happening with the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, I drew a blank. It, but it happened, the Enlightenment, thank you. Um, the It happens to line up with this idea of the Enlightenment where we can come together and grow as spiritual and philosophical people. And that's where the Renaissance comes in. So now we're kind of feeding back. And we also have, at the same time, the exact same ha thing that happened in the Renaissance where we have access much easier than our forefathers to these ancient texts and ancient ideas. And we can reference them and study them in a way that was unimaginable 20 years ago. So I think that's kind of why it's happening. Um, why it's not being embraced on a huge level. It's because universe, I, it, again, the universality of Freemasonry. And I think to be completely honest with you, we are fighting this membership quality, I mean, quantity over quality uh, mentality that hit us for a little bit. And we need to fight that. You know, that's one of the tenets of this, this movement is I'd rather be in a lodge of 10 good men than 100 people who really don't want to be there. You know, um, so I think that's why it's kind of coming back. That, that's my idea, at least. Yeah, Brother Lee. Right. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. That was very, very interesting um, in lots of ways. Um, I'm coming to you from Poland. Um, oh. And I, I'm actually an English Freemason, but I've been living in Poland for about six years now. And uh, over the course of that time, we've established the first English speaking lodge in Poland, of which I'm the Primus Worshipful Master. But in the country, there are only about 250 Freemasons mm. in the whole country. So I'm very interested in your your comments about um, giving people jobs that they're good at versus the hierarchy. Um, because one of the problems, well, basically we have a, a serious problem with numbers. There have been a few times when we've had to cancel meetings just because the requisite officers didn't turn up. Mm -hmm. When you have a lodge of only 11, <laughs> If three people don't make it, you know, you're getting close to, to things not working. So I've been advised by my grandmaster here um, to, to give offices to people who are not qualified and just to keep the lodge going. And, and so I, I wonder, you know, do you have any wisdom um, on how you, your ideas were great and I love them. And, when back in my time in England, I would absolutely, you know, where there's two million of us or something. <laughs> but but now there's only about 200 of us. Sometimes we do have to just give jobs to people just to make sure that those roles are filled. And I, I've seen over the past couple of years people being removed from office because they weren't capable of doing it. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I was told that you should give somebody the office that they will grow into, not the office that they're already capable of doing. Mm. Well, in, in a situation like ours, where you have so many, so few uh, members, do, do you have any thoughts on that? I, could you help me deal with that? Because <laughs> I feel I'm kind of on the frontier here. Um, well, I thank you for the question. Um, I, I, I will honestly say I'm not sure how they do it in Poland, but um, um, uh, but I will say this. So I think I think there's first of all I think there's hope. 
Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, a lodge getting down to, to that many people is, um, is necessarily uncommon. I mean, my lodge had 100 members in it and 12 showed up. You know, we might have the dues coming in, but we were a lodge of 12 people, you know, and, and, you know, we kind of went through the chairs and, and got stuff done um, when we could. And we ran into problems, you know, with, with a lot of the other lodges. Um, but, um, you know, there's a thing called Price's Law where the square root of the total number of people will do the half, will do half of the work. So, in the, um, you know, if a lodge of 110 people will actually make it work in a lodge of 10, you got a problem. <laughs> you know, it's through people. So um, the it, I, I first off, so if, I, I'm a mathematician, but I think we call it Pareto optimality in uh, mathematics. Well, the that how, rule. Uh, that's probably the right way. That's probably a guy <laughs> named Price just said, hey, I came up with this. <laughs> um, but um, um, so what I would say is this is. I kind of said it at the beginning where almost every one of these lodges that I've visited who have kind of gone down this path have never really worried about numbers or never worried about membership. They've just gotten this idea that no matter how many people are meeting in this room, this is going to be the best Masonic meeting that we've done to date. And the repercussions of all right. I know there's a lot of crap that we have to do to keep the lodge going. There's a lot of business stuff. There's a lot of stuff over here that's not really fun. I have to chase these guys down for dues. This guy's acting like a jerk on Facebook. You know that <laughs> that that sort of thing. Um, but when when the meeting happens, it all goes away. Like, and that meeting is your calling card as a lodge. So I would say, from my point of view, knowing absolutely nothing about your lodge. Um, if there was a starting point to go to, it would be make that next meeting one that can't be mixed, missed and then do it again and again. And that I honestly and truly believe will motivate people to want to help out more because what it sounds like is demotivation uh, rather than, <laughs> than being lost in the woods. If someone is part of something that makes them a better person, they're going to want to help out. And if they don't want to help out, you can tell them how they can help out because you're master. <laughs> and uh, hopefully they'll listen to you a little bit. But I would start there and, and like forget about the membership part for a little bit and just make your experience as good as possible and see where that goes. Um, that, that's my thought. I'd love to talk to you more about that after. I'm sure we could brainstorm together and come up with some ideas. So uh, yeah, please, please you. keep in touch. Yeah. Oh, that's that's uh, great, well. Brian. That's great advice. I I was thinking exactly the same thing. Don't worry about your membership. Provide quality education every night. Discussion, and and if you raise the level on the quality of your experience, then your members will be more engaged, and new members will show up. I'm mm -hmm. a huge believer in that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Wells. I saw your hand up. I would just want to, I'm from uh, Virginia, member of Liberty 95 in Bedford, and Taylor Masonic Lodge in Salem. And something you said really went back to something that we do here in this area. Uh, you were talking about the dress. And I'm a member of my mother lodge is a small country lodge. Uh, everybody comes just pretty much as they are. Taylor Lodge, which I've been very active with in the past, you know, all the line officers dress in tuxedos. Uh, everybody used to come in coat and tie, and that's now changing. But many years ago, we had a grandmaster in Virginia who put out an edict that basically said, dress your best for every lodge. We have another small lodge in Bedford called Mento. Mento was a farming lodge, meaning that it was a community lodge. Everybody that lived there were farmers. And my coach, when I went into Freemasonry, was Harvey Johnson. We now have what's called Harvey Johnson Night at Mento Lodge, and it attracts everybody. I mean, the Grand Master of Virginia, just about every one of them has it on their calendar. Because Harvey was a farmer. He went out, purchased a brand new pair of bib overalls, a brand new white shirt and 
He came out of the field, took a shower, put on brand new bib overalls, brand new white shirt, and went to lodge. And he said, this is my best. <laughs> and it was. Yep. And it was, I don't want to say a smack at a grandmaster, but it was kind of a, you highfalutin people in your fancy dress. That's not what lodge is about. Mm. And, and Harvey was a member of multiple lodges throughout the area. And now to honor Harvey, he's been dead 23 years. We have at, they have at Mento, Harvey Johnson night. And everyone comes in their finest bib overalls <laughs> and shirts. And the Grand Master usually wears a pair of bib overalls. Now he may have a top coat, but he's still got his bib overalls on. And this little small lodge usually may have eight members to 10 members at best on a regular stated. But on that night, we pack it usually with about 75 to 85 people. And we have the biggest pinto bean dinner you've ever seen afterwards. That's awesome. You know, it, to simplify it, you know, another way to look in that, um, at, at, this is this is a really simplified way of looking at this. Would you rather have a brother in your lodge who's dressed in the tux and stabbing you in the back, or a lodge who's dressed mm -hmm. in a torn shirt coming from work who's wearily to hug you like a brother? You know, mm -hmm. dress dress is something where um, it can be an outward expression of how much you respect the lodge, but it also does not matter. <laughs> you know, it, your heart is not in your pocket, right? Um, it's in your heart and it's in your chest. So it, it's Harvey a, wore it on, and Harvey wore it everywhere he went. Yeah. He was a full true Mason. So that's I, that's that's kind of why I, I'm hesitant to tell people how to dress. You know, it's it, every lodge has their own way of doing it. I would I do not care how well your lodge dresses. I care about what you're providing masonry. You know, that's, that's really yeah. it. So um, let's see. Uh, I have to move the screens because I'm always looking at the same 25 people. So hold on one second. Um, that's a lot of screens. <laughs> uh, Brother Paul again. Yeah, just a, a quick uh, for the brother from Poland where he's having a difficulty having people that are, shall I say, versed in lodge procedure and ritual to fill chairs. Most young guys, they go into lodge and they watch some of the ritual and that going on. They get scared to death to try because they don't know it. Take the brothers that you feel. And if you don't feel they're capable, you shouldn't have brought them into your lodge in the first place if they're not mentally capable of learning something. Help that brother learn something and make sure that the other brothers in the lodge that are already in line are not these ones that want to sit on the sideline and nitpick somebody because they're making some errors. Mm. Take this brother and give him a small piece of work to do, like the junior deacon or whatever. And then advancing from that point to the next step, to the next step. That's what the progression is meant to do, is to allow people to take small parts and then advance. If you have to stick him into a place above his station, try to get with him work with him before he has to do it in public and just and, and teach that is the master's job set the craft to work and give him proper instruction it's not to sit in the east and look like a king mm -hmm. amen i have to go brothers thank you for allowing me to be here thank you very much brother i appreciate that yeah and the mentorship is a, is a big thing about this you know um mentorship doesn't stop with your candidates you know one of the great things is when I was going through the chairs in my lodge, I had a brother who was trying his best too. And, you know, we would, Hey, sorry, buddy, you got to listen to the middle chamber lecture right now. Uh, <laughs> and then tell me where I screwed up. And, you know, like <laughs> it happened a lot, you know, and it, sometimes it's annoying as hell, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it's this great camaraderie that comes up with it. And um, yeah, it's, Unfortunately, you know, to, to one of the things I rarely speak ill of of masonry uh, because they, uh, Brother Jefferson, I'll, I'll get you right after this, I promise. So you don't have to keep your hand up. Um, one one of the things of, of masonry that I I'm kind of for forward about is 
these lodges that are master mason factories. Um, you know, they bring people in and they pump them through. And, and many times, to be extremely blunt, it doesn't end there. They become a master mason and it's like, all right, now you need to hear the real secrets. Come join Scottish Rite. And, and you know, like, you know, I've seen uh, a mason go get a Scottish Rite uh, certificate on the day of his raising, and with no no plans of education or anything. And it becomes, dare I say it, like almost like a Masonic pyramid scheme. Like, pay these dues and we'll give you the truth. You know, and it's I know that's kind of hard to say and it's kind of harsh, but it's it's true. Um, so if we use our mentorship capabilities with our with our officers as well and say like hey you're going to be representing the east i mean you know the south right now what does that mean let's talk about this think about this while you're going through your chair and why you say these things in ritual by the time you get up to the east in the progressive line you're going to have a serious knowledge of the craft um but that doesn't happen unless both parties are interested and we've got to make sure that both parties are interested and that, that's a very hard thing to do when there's not a lot of party to go around. You know, um, it's a hard thing to do. And many times it revolves many hats on one person and without support, they get burnt out. And I'm telling you that from personal experience. So, um, you know, it's, it's all based around meaning and effort really. Anyone else? Oh, uh, bro brother Jefferson, oh. I you're being a jerk now. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Thank you very much, uh, brother, for the presentation. It was wonderful. I just want to ask a couple of follow on questions and reference some tertiary topics to address this evening, but they fall right into this this idea of uh, the Renaissance, specifically the you know, Medici family, the Hermeticism, all that kind of stuff that came out of the, the Renaissance and what we're experiencing now, uh, and not everywhere, but in a lot of places this renaissance of an investment in esoteric knowledge. Uh, and that's, you know, can be a controversial subject at time. It varies from, from community to community, lodge to lodge, generational cohort to generational cohort, I have found. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what has been your observations as to that, how that's handled, dress, you know, um, best in a way that's non-frictional, but still uh, gets to the other thing you were talking about, which is this idea of providing a vehicle for spiritual fulfillment and transformation. And secondly, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, traditional observance of Freemasonry. Okay. Um, so first question is like, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, is like you, when you're introducing this sort of stuff, you're going to get hiccups and you're going to get roadblocks. Is that, is that what you're kind of getting at? Sure. And it varies from lodge to lodge, as you know, and yeah. from community to community. You see an interest in it more with the younger generation than you do the old, although that's not always true. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly is a part of the original craft. I mean, our, our craft is dripping with it. It's overflowing with it, if you know what you're looking at. Uh, and I was wondering how you see, you've taken examples of these lodges and how they've addressed these other parts of this renaissance. I'm wondering if you could share some best practices or stuff that's worked with other lodges that are pursuing that particular part uh, mm -hmm. of this renewal. And what they've done that's been working, you know, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure I was answering the actual question. Um, so um, the first thing that I see that helps with anything on this sort of level um, is actually the first reward we get as a master mason, which is travel. You know, men, almost in all instances, the people who fight these ideas or they fight this someone has a different viewpoint than me, I don't like it, are people who stay in their lodge. <laughs> you know, um, I, I firmly believe that that is one of the great reasons why that is the reward for becoming a Master Mason. It's like you now can witness what's out there. And visiting and traveling doesn't do anything if you don't bring it back. You know, you, so um, in my travels, I, and, you know, I, I belong to a jurisdiction where there are very, very obvious lodges that do not want anything to do with this and still you know i get asked to go and i and one thing that i've found interesting is i've actually after knowing so many people have found that i really don't know an anti-education lodge 
I know a lodge that has a few people in it who are anti-education, who are yelling louder than everybody else so that it doesn't happen. But there's always someone in that room who's looking for something. And that's one of the great things about incorporating the arts into it is because I'm sure as you all agree, you know, you go into a lodge and go, I'm talking Kabbalah. <laughs> and you're going to lose two thirds yeah. of that lodge instantaneously and they already don't like you. If but, they even recognize the word. Yeah. But you can use different, uh, you can use different uh, methods of talking about stuff and, um, and, and bring it to those people in different ways. And uh, through the arts, through music, movies, I think, are one of the best ones. Hey, you want to talk about Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Get together and watch The Matrix. Now, <laughs> there you go. You just watched it. Or watch an older movie. But there's, I find that most of the time when people are fighting education, it's because, A, they're uncomfortable. Uh, B, they're, they're afraid of looking like an idiot. And that was me too. Like, you know, I don't know this. How, why am I here? I feel like I'm the dumb one in the room, but I just don't want to be that guy. Can we please stop talking? You know, and the ways you get around that are, you know, figuring out the best ways to provide this sort of thing, making sure that the lodge environment that you're in is a loving environment that people trust each other and are comfortable with sharing things um, in ways that we're not going to share in any other place. And being willing to have conversations. I think discussions, for example, are the greatest form of Masonic education. Get up there and say, read a piece of ritual. Hey, what does this mean to you? There's no wrong answers in the room. You know, you just got to get people to talk. So I think providing that again, providing that, that place where, and even if that place is just you, providing where that's welcome will help those doors open. Um, your second question was uh, traditional observance. So um, I'm going to be completely open with you. Uh, I have I left my my home lodge for reasons I'm not going to get into, and the only lodge that I joined afterward was a TO lodge. And honestly, the way TO lodge works was not the pull that got me into that lodge. The reason that I went into that lodge is because of the relationship I had with the brothers who were already in it. You know, the ma the founding master of that lodge is my my youngest godfather. You know, um, his, the master of the lodge now is that brother's other's uh, uh, godfather. So we, we're close. There's a brotherhood there. And I love the fact that when I go to lodge, I'm going to something that's completely different, like I was kind of talking about. I wasn't talking about TO Lodge in this presentation. In fact, half of those, yes, there were some TO Lodges in that map that I showed you, but many of them weren't. Um, and I think the TO Lodge is just, it's, I prefer it. I prefer the way it works. I know it's not for everybody. I like, one of the things I like about TO Lodges in particular, oh, and does everybody understand where the traditional observance Lodge is? I okay, I I kind of do, but okay, so I let, me, let me take a quick step back. And so, a traditional observance lodge um, is um, a lodge that's set up in its bylaws to provide masonry as close to the original way as possible. So, things that you're going to see in lodge specifically is no talking, um, excellence in ritual. Um, you're going to have things like incense, you're going to have musical selections, periods of reflection and uh, meditation. Um, usually, almost always, they're in tuxedos, um, and um, education is um, prevalent in the meeting. For example, in my, my new lodge, in Phoenix Lodge, uh, we do not have business. Our, our business comes up and they say, is there any business who come before the lodge? And they say, no, because the committees have taken care of it. That's excellent. So um, the bills are done. Everything's done. The only thing that happens in lodge is the stuff that is required by Grand Lodge, which is the reading of any official uh, meetings, um, reading of, of uh, petitions and that sort of thing. Everything else is not happening. That's why we have committees. And so um, the reason I love it so much is because I traveled two and a half hours from work to get to this lodge and it damn well better be worth it when I get there. <laughs> uh, and it is, 
It is. We have a guest speaker at every meeting. Uh, if not, we have a lot of people who do a lot of research in our lodge, so they provide education at, at always. We don't meet as much. We only meet five times a year because, and our dues are high. We have high dues so that we can pay for all this. Um, that's just the way they set it up in their bylaws. And there's, there's a handful of them around. There's a symposium called the Masonic Restoration Symposium that happens uh, where these lodges kind of come together and figure out how they can do things better and, and have guest speakers. Um, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Um, but again, it's not for everybody and that's cool. You know, I, I'm willing to bet I would have a ton of fun in that lodge in Virginia. I know I would have a lot of fun. I would have too much fun in that lodge in Virginia. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to knock that at all. So, brother Thank Kevin. You, I was, uh, I was uh, and I'm from Maine, so I know who you guys are. So it was a bit yeah. of a loaded question, but I always impressed with what you guys do. And, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys have a waiting list. I mean, you're way beyond capacity with folks who want to join you. No, actually. Um, so, Lodge I'm in right now, we do not have a lot of members. We have a limit to members. Um, so our lodge will only allow 72 members at a time. We will not, we will not anymore. Um, wow. But right now, um, uh, TO is very foreign to New Hampshire. And um, we're getting over some roadblocks with that. But it's, people are starting to talk about us now. Um, not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it's Probably a little both. We'll, we'll see. But I love every time I go to lodge in there, so I'm happy. <laughs> brother Kevin, long time no see. <laughs> I know it's been a long time, brother Ryan, but we should fix that soon. <laughs> but I, well, yeah, well, actually, no, last night. But <laughs> um, my question for you is, and it kind of goes into the TO a little bit, but more about the Masonic Renaissance as a whole, about bringing education into the lodge. How do you temper that knowing that you're going to have entered apprentices and fellow crafts in that lodge? So should you, should you set up other meetings during the month, if possible, to go into some of the deeper parts of, you know, the, the MM and other things? Or should you try to keep it open-ended and then... Explain, because there have been things that you have said to me as an entered apprentice, things that you said to me when I was a fellow craft, and things that you've now said to me as a master mason, all of which I could know as an entered apprentice, but have grown upon as I've gone through the other degrees. So how would you advise someone like me who wants to bring education into my lodge to begin when it comes to the deeper stuff? Yeah, great question. So I think... Uh...